So we're absolutely delighted to have David Marcus here with us today. He is the co-founder, chief executive officer, and chief investment officer of Evermore Global Advisors. He co-founded the firm in 2009 and is the portfolio manager of the Evermore Global Value Fund and the firm's separate account portfolios. Beginning his career in 1988 at the Mutual Series Fund, where he was mentored by the renowned value investor Michael Price, David rose to uh, manage the Mutual European Fund and co-manage the Mutual Shares and Mutual Discovery Funds, representing over $14 billion in assets. He also served as Director of European Investments for, for Franklin Mutual Advisors. In 2000, he founded uh, Markstone Capital Management, a long, short, Europe-focused equity manager, largely funded by Swedish financier Jan Steinbeck. After uh, Mr. Steinbeck passed away in 2002, Mr. Marcus closed Mark Stone, co-founded a family office for the Steinbeck family, and advised on the restructuring of a number of the public and private companies that the family controlled. He later founded and served as managing partner of Mark Cap Investors, which was seeded by Reservoir Capital. Uh, he graduated from Northeastern University in 1988 with a bachelor's in business administration and a concentration in finance. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Marcus. Sure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So how about we just get started by you uh, describing a little bit your investment philosophy, your research process, things along those lines. Sure. Well, we are a special situations firm. We're looking for companies that are, they're cheap stocks with catalysts, essentially. We're looking for companies that are, they could be breakups, spinoffs, restructurings. We're looking for value, but we're looking for something to see how will that value get sort of as we say, out of the stock and into the shareholders' hands. Uh, because there's a lot of, there are a lot of value opportunities out there, but uh, many times you just never get to this, the shareholder. It's just, if it's always in the, in the stock and it just never gets to you, it's of, no, it's of no value. And so we want it to get to us. And so we focus on catalysts. And then we also focus on companies where there's a main owner, a family, or a couple of families that control it. We think that those kinds of controlled businesses can be incredibly good long-term compounding machines because they're not thinking about this quarter or next quarter. They're making longer term uh, investments uh, and decisions. And it's critically important to understand who they are. So it's, it's always driven by doing a lot of deep analysis, but the numbers are only half the story. At the end of the day, it's also the people. Uh, you need, if you let uh, we say, basically, we're investing in jockeys, not just horses, because the horse doesn't know what to do. It needs somebody to guide it. Same with businesses. You need the right people at the top. So we need a good horse and you need a great jockey. Absolutely. That sounds great. Has there been any issues, though, with uh, with family owned businesses where you felt like, you know, maybe because they're, you know, trying to keep it more in the family, the businesses are run maybe in a suboptimal way or there's been some sort of corporate governance issues? Well, uh, look, not every family controlled company is a great investment, just like not every value case is a great investment. Um, some of the families are focused on sort of creating value for themselves as the main owner. And then they kind of let us as shareholders tag along. That's okay. We'll take it. We're happy with that. If we like what they're doing. If they're working against the shareholders, different story. We're gonna avoid those. We don't care how cheap it is. You have, when it's a family controlled business, you kind of have to buy into the family. You either like the DNA, the way they think, the way they operate, the way they make decisions, or you don't. Because inevitably they may do something that you're not, is not a today decision. It's something that's much longer term. And if you don't buy into the way they think about investing, you really should not be uh, there. You know, I've been on calls with uh, family controlled businesses and they're, they're telling me about how they get a call from the sell side who just wants to know about this quarter and next quarter, selling an asset. Why don't you sell it today? Meanwhile, it was the first business they ever bought. They're never going to sell it. And so you, you just, you, you have to sort of, as I say, buy into it, but you, you have to be very careful and understand corporate governance. Do they just put their relatives on the board, uh, their internal uh, decision uh, processes for who can get on the board from the family. You know, I've seen companies where the family says, you know, the next generation, they can't be operating people. They have to be board members. They cannot be making the key decisions because they get fearful that the next generation might have not five 
people, but 40 because they're all cousins. Who's going to run it? And you eliminate that by having structure and process for how decisions are made. And they basically force the larger family group to adhere to those uh, processes. And that's what allows them to become multi-generational opportunities that can be, as I say, wonderful compounders over uh, time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I think. Have you had a case where you, let's say, invested in a business and it was a family-owned business and you thought it was, you know, you thought they were on your side and then after investing, you know, you see some, some of the decisions they made and, you know, you learn that, you know, your interests are not aligned. And if so, uh, how do you try and remedy that mistake? Do you typically just sell out once you, once you discover that? Do you sometimes sue the company? Uh, what do you do usually about that? So look, over my, I've been around for a while. Uh, I've been investing for over 25 years now. I think I, even 30 years. Yeah, about 30. And so, yeah, we've come across all kinds. Uh, at one point, um, there was a company that we, uh, in my previous business, we invested in, in uh, Germany where there was a family that controlled it. They did bring in professionals, uh, professional managers, but there was a family that dominated it. And um, we thought it was grossly undervalued. And we liked what they were doing. Um, we asked them about stock buybacks. This, the balance sheet was overcapitalized. They had a lot of cash. They didn't need it for the business. They were just letting it pile up. And we said, well, why don't you buy back some stock? And um, frankly, just as we were hanging, they said, oh, that's very interesting. And that's all we had asked them. And yet after we hung up, we hung up, another person from our group that was in Germany said, you're not going to believe what they said after you got off the phone. They said, how do we get rid of this Marcus guy? We don't want, like him and his firm as shareholders. Um, maybe we should have a profit warning. That'll scare them out. And they were, they were really talking about committing, I would say, fraud. And, uh, and so we ended up actually doing a proxy fight with the company. We weren't looking to get into a war. But ultimately, the shareholders really decided to vote with uh, the management and the family. I would say the shareholders actually voted against not only their own best interests, but really, so the family owned 27%. And yet one of the things on the vote was to change the threshold for certain votes where you would need more than um, a certain percentage, which basically guaranteed this family that they would be the critical vote in everything going forward instead of a majority. They, so they, had, they sort of had what you would call negative control. And I at least told other shareholders, you should, you should basically, I don't care if you don't vote for our proposal, don't give them that, you're working against your own interests. People all voted for that, and then, I, including the union that was had employees there. And I, I said, you're, "They're probably going to fire you guys. We, won't, we we don't we're not trying to take over your company. You just want the right management team." And in any case, what ended up happening was that uh, the family won, and ultimately, um, some of the people from the union lost their jobs. They called us later on and said, "Oh, is there any way you'd come back?" I'm like, "Absolutely not. We lost." So it's it's too. It's too much. Uh, we ended up uh, moving on from that position because our view was you can't beat them now. There was a shot at that vote, but the vote went the other way. And so sometimes they don't work out. We moved on. Uh, it's a valuable lesson about doing proxy fights in other countries, uh, how it works. Uh, the press was aligned against anybody from the U.S. in that case. So you were always sort of in a negative a perspective, it doesn't matter. As I said, we learn from it, we, we, we move on. Sometimes it's the other way. You have companies that were once family controlled, they spin it off because they're doing something else uh, from a regulator. We own a company in Sweden called MTG, Modern Times Group. Um, it used to be part of a group, uh, you'd say it in, in English, Kinevik. In Sweden, I guess they'd say it, Kinevik, which is a big conglomerate controls a variety of businesses. And MTG was, was uh, a, broad, a free to air broadcaster and uh, they also had a pay TV business. And eventually the, the conglomerate wanted to buy the cable system, the largest cable system. In. And to do that, the regulator said, you have to get out of the, the streaming and broadcasting business. So they spun it off the shareholders. 
I mean, they were going to sell part and, and that deal fell through when the acquiring company got acquired by somebody else. Putting all that to the side, it came out uh, as a company that was a public company that after a while split into two companies, the streaming and then the online and mobile gaming business. And we loved both pieces. The bottom line is it didn't have a main shareholder anymore. Yet the DNA from the family, the style, the approach, the way they built the business, it was still part of the company. And the management team really adhered to those principles. So it had all the characteristics of a great long-term thinking, uh, a family that was making good decisions long-term, even though it had no control shareholder. Uh, and so um, it, it, to me, it kind of takes me all the way back to the beginning of my uh, uh, investment process when I worked for Michael Price, where it was about getting to know the companies, but getting to know who are the people. Your, this concept of you're betting on people and building your network and being able to vet and understand ideas by going through your network uh, because you can get so much due diligence accomplished, maybe not the numbers, but the softer side by talking to the other families in the industry, the other controlling shareholders of the competition. And so the more of a network you can grow, I think in the long run, you just you get a more 3D image of the companies that you're looking at. That makes sense. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your, your time with, with Michael Price, maybe some of the other key lessons that you learned from him? And also, how did you start uh, working with him in the, in the first place? How did you get the job at, um, at uh, Mutual Series Fund? Sure. Um, so I, I, I grew up uh, in, a, in a family where my dad and my uncle owned a two-man stock brokerage firm. Uh, and all they did was talk about stocks all day long. They wanted to find the next Xerox, the next IBM, the next whatever. And I used to ask them as a kid, well, why do you need the next one? Why can't you just buy that one? And so there was always debate about stocks. So I, I always knew that I wanted to be in this business in some way. Uh, and I went to Northeastern University in Boston, which has a program called the co-op program. And the co-op program means that it's a five-year, I'm not going to do a commercial here for Northeastern, but, but it's a five-year undergrad instead of four years, because by the time you have graduated, you will have done um, you have worked uh, long-term internships, which they call co-ops, six months full-time, not going to school during that period, three times. So by the time you graduate, it's still four years, four-year education, but it takes five years because you don't really get your summers off after the first summer. You're either working or you're in school on a rotation. And uh, I, my first internship, I was at, uh, I think, IBM. I learned all about expense accounting, uh, but for six months. But my second one was working at a bank in Boston that doesn't exist anymore called Shawmut Bank. They did the back office for Michael Price's mutual fund. So I really was very lucky that I was there as a customer service rep intern answering phones. People you know, didn't get their dividend check, uh, whatever. They wanted prospectuses on the fund. This is before you had the internet. So uh, you, everything was phone calls, uh, mailing things out, whatever. And, uh, but I learned the front lines of dealing with investors and all of that. And for my last co-op, I wanted to work in New York. And so my manager at the bank re uh, recommended me to um, Michael and the people that ran uh, the firm. And they had never hired a co-op student like me before I went to Northeastern, I'd never even heard of it. And so uh, they gave me an opportunity and I worked there starting in, in June of 1987. Uh, and I know you're a little younger than me or maybe a lot. Uh, in 1987, there was a crash, the crash of 87. So I was answering phones during the crash of 87. And uh, it's a great time to start in the business because you just, you're dealing with, on one hand, I'm watching Michael and his team uh, talking about stocks, uh, seeing how they're reacting during this crisis. At the same time, I'm taking shareholder calls. In those days, you could, you could buy from a phone call, but you couldn't sell. I think you couldn't sell on the phone, only buy. So you, people are panicking, they're screaming, they're calling, and you can't even, you're like, oh, you have to go to the bank and get a signature guarantee. It's a whole process. It's more information than you asked me for. But the bottom line is that I was lucky that he gave me a shot to uh, work there as an intern and then at the end of my internship 
I was offered the opportunity to come back after I graduated um, to be there as a full timer. By then, Michael had moved the business from um, right around the corner from the stock exchange at 26 Broadway to New Jersey. Uh, and so I just wanted to start so bad that I actually, I left school before I had completed my last few classes, I started working, took a couple of classes in New Jersey at a local college. Uh, and then for graduation, one week, and I, gr I drove back home to New York, picked up my parents, drove up to Boston, went to my graduation, we drove home the next day, and I was back in the office Monday. And I don't even think the school today would let you take your last two classes somewhere else and transfer the credits back. But somehow I was able to make that happen. And so, and then I, I was there full time from 1988 until I left in 2000. And it was a great environment because you worked, you sat in one big gigantic room with a trading desk in the middle and the analysts and everybody were in the same room. And really the whole room was Michael's office. He had an office, but he really just sat out in uh, uh, the, the main room. And so if you did, I like to say, if you did well, you heard nothing. And if you made a mistake, everybody heard about it. And uh, it's just the way it was, but you learned so much just by listening to him, uh, uh, interacting with the other people in the room. I, you, I don't think you could ask for a better environment to learn, especially because there were no offices. It was all out in the open. And um, at some point he offered me the shot to work on, as his assistant or one of his assistants on the trading desk. Remember I was, a, I, was a, I was answering phones for customer service. So he asked me to come in to his office. He said, I'm looking for somebody to be an assistant on the trading desk. He said he'd interviewed about 30 people. Everybody had baggage from other firms because they all knew what they wanted to do and how to trade. He said, I'm looking for somebody who knows absolutely nothing. David, I think you're perfect. And so I, literally that, that's what happened. And it's like, you don't know if you want to jump up and down and scream, yeah, because I was just told that I don't know absolutely nothing uh, or, or what. But the reality is his point was, um, we'll teach you our way, how to read the newspaper, how to look at uh, situations. I was there to be a trader. So I learned uh, as a trader, but then I really just did anything I could to have some FaceTime with Michael. We didn't have, we didn't have cable TV. It stopped across the street from the office. There was no internet. So I, I hired, I helped hire some guys and I helped hunt, literally hook up a satellite dish on the roof. So he, cause in the, during the Gulf war, 1991, he's like, Hey, there's a war. I need to see what's going on. And so then of course I volunteered to make that happen. And then every day I was getting, I'll say screamed at, is this thing going to work before the war is over? Um, and, and so let's just say I had it ready just after the war ended. So, um, that was before you had direct TV. So the satellite dishes were 10 foot dishes. I mean, I, I was pulling cables through the building while I was on the trading desk. I mean, I would just run around. I really just wanted to get, and I just wanted to be in the thick of it and, and just, as I say, uh, learning. And then at some point, Michael uh, gave me my opportunity, which is, um, and, and this to me is one of the greatest lessons of all. I know this is not an investing lesson, but this is about taking advantage of opportunities. Oppor I tell my kids all the time, opportunities are whizzing by all day long. You got to put yourself in the path of opportunity. And so uh, I, I lived in a small town in New Jersey that was, I lived, I had, I started, I really didn't have any money. I lived above a store. It was a trophy shop. They engraved trophies. And to get 25 bucks off my rent a month, I would mow the lawn. And the lady who owned the building would give me this old lawnmower that had the circle blades and like the old non-powered ones. One day I'm mowing the lawn and who's going in the trophy shop, Michael Price. And um, uh, he's like, what are you moonlighting? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I was like hundred degrees outside. I said, oh, I got them to knock 25 bucks off my, my rent. So in any case, um, it's the randomness of things happening. He, he's like, I'm taking my kids to Burger King after this. Do you want to go with us? Sure. I'm sweating up a storm. I get in the car, realize I don't have any money to pay for anything. But he's like, do you know this part of New Jersey? And he drove me. I, I was the greatest afternoon. He drove me all around New Jersey, giving me a tour of, of that part of New Jersey. And by the end of the, the ride, I, was, I asked him, I had been thinking about this forever. Michael, can I get off the trading desk? I want to be an analyst. I want to do research. I want an opportunity to do that. 
he's like, I don't really need any more uh, analysts. He's like, but um, let me think about it. And the next day he said, okay, you can show me ideas on your own. Uh, and so I just started, I was already staying late. I would stay late. I'd come in early. I was reading everything I could. And I would slowly pitch ideas to him. Uh, I didn't know EBIT. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I just knew I wanted to be in this. And um, he just gave me my opportunity. And, and then to just wrap all that up, I'll say quickly, I latched on to some of the people in the office and tried to learn from them. So he gave me my shot. He said, okay, you're a junior analyst. So I became a grunt for everybody in the room. And, uh, and then at some point I realized when I would have the wherewithal to pitch ideas that he always had an opinion when you pitched a U.S. idea, always. And um, what I found was that if when you've pitched something that was outside the U.S., you had a different shot at getting it focused on. So there was one guy who did all the non-U.S. He quit to go to a hedge fund. So when he left, it opened up the whole world to everybody. So at the age of 26, I got to the point where I discovered Sweden, which was going through a banking crisis. and um, there was nothing but cheap stocks there. And so I ended up, I, I didn't even have a passport. I'd never been anywhere. I'd never been outside the United States. So I got a passport. I went to Sweden and I had the whole country to myself as a U.S. investor. Now, even though I was a, just a kid doing it, what I, and, but what I found was that, in a, and this was a valuable life lesson on investing, which is in a crisis, people go home. The Brits go back to the UK, the Germans back to Germany, the Americans to America. I went to Sweden in the middle of the banking crisis. I had the whole country to myself. And then quickly I realized there were families that controlled all these companies and I'd go call on them, the Wallenbergs, the Stenbecks, the Londins, whoever. And I started building my own network. And even the network came out of a discussion with Michael. I mean, I learned so much from him. It's like, even as you're asking me about it, I'm realizing there were more things that I don't think about. I was looking at a company and I asked him, I'm like, you know, the guy that owns that chain of stores, can we ask him how they would value this piece? He's like, yeah, that guy's in my network. Go build your own network. So I had to go get all these answers on my own, but it was, it was sort of like really tough, tough, tough training, uh, but it was fantastic. So just to wrap uh, that up, I'll say, I got lucky, all these families that I got to know in Europe. So I did that in Sweden, then I went all over the Nordics, then I went to Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, meeting all the families. I kind of always stayed out of the UK because my view is that's where all the other American guys are going. I wanted to go where people were not going to get more compelling opportunities. And then at some point I decided, so in 1996, Michael sold the firm to Franklin Templeton It became Franklin Mutual. Uh, he left about two years later. And when he left, I was promoted to run a significant chunk of the, of the assets or manage or co-manage and head of European investing. Um, but by 2000, I decided it was time to do my own thing. And I called all these families that I had stakes in their companies just to say somebody else would be in charge of it. And one of them, the Stenbeck, the patriarch of the Stenbeck family said, look, I'd like to be partners with you. So I owned in the fund 8% of his holding company Genovic, but he had spun off six or seven other public companies. We owned 8% of six or seven companies. So we were the biggest holder after the family. And um, after he invited me to spend a weekend on his boat with him in the Bahamas, um, by the end of the weekend, I had a commitment for $100 million to launch my fund. He was going to be my partner. He was going to share his office in New York, where he had the whole top floor of the Citicorp building. And I thought, okay, now I have to go back and actually quit my job. I hadn't actually, I'd worked there so long. It was a tough, uh, but I quit. I kicked off the, uh, uh, the fund. We grew very rapidly. I think we were close to 500 million pretty quickly in about a year or so. And then sort of the, uh, the worst possible thing could happen is that uh, Jan Stenbeck, who was my partner and the chairman of all these companies, he died. So he was 59 years old. He died. Uh, his, his empire was really in, in a tough situation. I would say some of the CFOs in his group were what I would call there because he liked to have certain kinds of CFOs so he could kind of control everything. So without him there controlling them, uh, making key decisions when I say control, 
uh, it really, it was a troubled situation. Um, they had a company named Millicom, it trades on NASDAQ. It was careening towards bankruptcy because uh, their debt was going from, from pick bonds to cash pay. They just didn't know what to do. Um, so Millicom ended up hiring me as an advisor. I helped bring Lazard in. We restructured the balance sheet. The stock went from 50 cents to $100 in the next couple of years. Um, having gone from a 3 billion cap to a 30 million cap with a billion of debt, it went the other way and then some. Um, so in any case, when he died, his daughter inherited control of all these companies. She had just started working for me as my junior person. So if you could imagine, my junior person became my largest investor. And she asked me to help her. And I, I loved the dad. And I'm going to bring it to the present now because I feel like I'm answering. I'm giving you way more than you asked for. And I'm so sorry. Uh, like I'm off on a tangent. I think I'm on a tangent of a tangent of a tangent. No, no, it's great. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Okay. So... The bottom line is she asked me to help her. I said, great. Why don't we build a family office for you and your siblings here in New York? Uh, and then once we get it going, you bring in a professional and I'll step aside. I didn't really want to be a family office person. Uh, my view was always, I'll never have my own family office running somebody else's. And I, you know, you aspire, you want to get to the point where you can have your own family office. And so, um, so I did that uh, we, with another person that was in their group. I, I became the chairman of their US, which was a conglomerate holding company and like a venture cap portfolio, all kinds of quirky stuff he was incubating in the US. Um, so the net of it is we built the family office, created the rainy day fund, which to me was set aside X millions of dollars. So if all their stocks went to zero, they were still mega wealthy. So it was stocks outside of their uh, universe of telecom and media related uh, businesses. And uh, once they were in good shape, that's when I decided to move on and go work, uh, set up my own business again. So I closed my fund to, to go work with the family. Um, and in fact, MTG that I mentioned to you before, the media company, I, that was one of their companies. I, I was on the board for nine years. But the, the gaming businesses they ended up investing in and becoming the core of their company, they made all those investments after I left the board. So it just shows you how uh, businesses can uh, evolve. But sitting on the boards, helping restructure companies, helping make these key decisions, I got to get some, I got something that most analysts and investors and stockbrokers never get, operating experience. Seeing how it works from the inside out. How are decisions made? Uh, how do you deal with crisis? How do you deal with taking advantage of markets? And so I really consider myself so lucky that I learned so much from Michael Price, but I also learned from Jan Stenbeck when he was alive, obviously, how he built his empire. I would, I would, I would go to Luxembourg where he, he lived part of the year and I would sit in the, his kitchen with him and the CEOs of all his public companies and they would just talk about business, how we're going to take over telecom in this country or that country or whatever. So at that point, I was never investing in any of their companies because I was in the thick of it with them. You just couldn't pay for that kind of education. And so it's, it's but so then I wanted to utilize the operating experience as I moved on to do other things. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for sharing that commentary. It's, it's very, very intriguing. You asked for a simple answer and I gave you a... You know, <laughs> it's but. fantastic. Um, are there any special suggestions in particular which you find very interesting, like mergers, spinoffs, um, merger arbitrage, those types of things? Um, you know, look, we, we really will, will cut across the spectrum. That said, I do think that when something is a, a reorg situation, maybe it's heading into a, a bankruptcy or a reorg, it's less appealing uh, to us because that requires more specialized uh, uh, legal uh, perspective in many cases doesn't mean we won't look at a specific case, uh, but we're, we really are focusing. I think over time we've evolved. We have evolved as, as investors uh, where sometimes companies with, with bad balance sheets, a lot of debt. Some investors say, oh, there's a lot of debt. I won't even look at it. Well, sometimes a lot of debt creates a compelling equity story. Um, and so we're open to different ideas when we understand the process and the path. We generally stay, will stay away from um, very commodity type businesses, for example, until there's a crisis. So we stayed away from the shipping industry. We never looked at it until 2016 
when the whole industry was was on the on its deathbed, and they had overbuilt ships, the demand was down, so it was sort of the perfect storm of disaster, and the stocks were down between eighty and ninety something percent. So having never looked at them before, we started looking at them, getting to know the players, the families. The shipping is, is dominated by family groups globally, Greek, Norwegian, uh, all kinds of uh, groups all over the world. Uh, and we spend time just getting to know all of them. It's one of the most over-conferenced industry is shipping. It's incredible. We used to ask them, how do you have time to run your business? You're always at a conference. Uh, and... And so we learned a lot. We ended up making some investments, uh, some of them, uh, uh, and we came in really early before the industry had really started to pick up. And uh, so we'll look at commodities, but only when you're, you're gone, you've gone through some extreme uh, situation. And um, I, I would say things that we avoid, again, commodities generally, we're not going to buy gold miners. It's just, it's, it's just not what we do. And so we stay away from... We, we might look at mining equipment companies, but we're not trying to make sort of a cyclical call on anything. We really would rather spend more of our time on companies where they are going through a transition or it's just a great business mispriced. Or what we have found many times is that you have a conglomerate. So if you have a conglomerate, generally the market will value a conglomerate at its weakest business, even if that's a smaller piece of the pie. That's where the market's needle will go. So if they take that, if you think of like a pizza, right? I like to think about pizza. But if you think about a pizza, uh, you could, you know, it's, it's a bad analogy. But let's say one, let's say two slices of the pie are low margin businesses that are very somewhat volatile. The rest are nice businesses, growing businesses, solid margins, uh, and they have real pricing power. The market's needle is going to those two slices. It's, it's Achilles heel. It's its weakest link. They may not be the worst businesses, but they're the worst in that pie. Those are the plain slices. They don't have any toppings, you know. And so then the company gives away those slices or better yet sells them. And all of a sudden the market's needle goes to, I'll say, the next worst business. Um, and it's what you realize is that as that happens, you can get a complete revaluation. And my quick example would be if let's say I'm a division in a company, you're a division in a company, and some other person that you're, is in your class is another guy or gal in a company. You both each earn a dollar a share a year. That's the value of your division. So you're one, she's one, I lose a dollar. So it's one plus one, two minus one, a dollar. We report a dollar of earnings. Well, you guys and your board decide, let's get rid of this dude. He's a loser. He's losing a dollar a share a year. So you, you sell me for 50 cents, right? Just the value of my blubber, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you get your 50 cents. You either give that to the shareholders, you pay down some debt, you buy back stock, or you reinvest it in your two growing businesses. But in any case, forget the 50 cents for a moment. The fact is, remember, it was $1 plus one is two, minus one is a dollar. You get rid of me, your earnings just doubled back to $2. Boom, in one shot. Plus you have the 50 cents that you can deploy, you can invest, you can give it back to the shareholders. And so we find that when companies have uh, this kind of mentality to kind of evolve the business, um, if they have a good plan and we have to understand who they are, as I said before, as the jockey, these can be fantastic businesses that in phase one, you're, you're investing in the transition. In phase two, it may turn into a compounder because it's such a nice business and it always has, but it was masked by um, these other businesses. You know, there's a, there's a company in France called Kering. It's a luxury brands company. They also had a stake in Puma, but they also had furniture stores and other things. The market valued it at its weakest link, the furniture store, low margin business. Um, when they... Um, finally got rid of those businesses and redeployed the money to Gucci and to other things, guess what happened? Not only did it do well, it did ridiculously well because it got valued like the luxury brands companies, which were very sort of overvalued. I don't know, overvalued, but high multiple stocks. So this thing went from a, like a 10 multiple to a 
over the next few years to like a 35 multiple. I, on, we got off the train very early. So maybe we, we made 60 or 70% on our investment. And had we kept it, we would have had an eight bagger. So it, we, we, you know, we left a lot on the table. We didn't stay long enough on the compounding period. And so that was another lesson that we've kind of learned along the way is that the thesis panned out, but part of our initial thesis should have been that this should evolve into a compounder. And then we would not really have to sell it for a long period of time. That family control business again, where there's something to do. The other kind that we, we, we love are liquidations. So when people hear the word liquidations or liquidation, they generally run away. They think fire sale, it's, it's not of interest. And what we have found, and I, 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 there's a video somewhere, I, I saw Seth Klarman a long time ago talk about liquidations can be sort of great investments because it, most people run away. If you do your homework there, you can realize there's a lot of value. Um, you know, I'll just mention too quickly. quickly um, we owned something in Singapore called K1 Ventures. It doesn't exist anymore. It was set up sort of like a private equity, publicly traded private equity business, made a variety of investments. It always traded well below its NAV and the market just never valued it properly. Um, it had everything from rail car leasing businesses uh, to uh, I think it was called Knowledge Universe, which was Michael Milken's company had a stake. It even had a stake in Guggenheim Securities. All these kind of quirky things traded at a huge discount. So at some point, the management led by the chairman decided to bid for the company to take it private. They wanted to sort of capture all the value. It was trading, I think it was a 40 cent dollar. Um, and their, their take private failed. So we do keyword searches. You asked me at the beginning, how do we do our work? Part of it is doing searches, not on numbers, but on words. Breakup, spinoff, liquidation, restructuring. If you did this combination, patriarch plus died plus holding company, you'll get a lot of transitioning businesses out there. They used to only generate Asian conglomerate transitioning. You get a lot of German ones now and others. But the key is one of our, our searches on keywords um, found K1 because the, the, it was sort of a fail to take private. And when we looked at it, we said, oh, okay. It's interesting because not only are they not going to take it private now, but the chairman's letter said, well, since we couldn't take it private, now we'll optimize it. Now we'll try to make the most money we can and distribute all of it to the shareholders. In other words, because we couldn't take the value for ourselves, we guess we'll share it <laughs> with all the shareholders. And so nobody even covered the stock. Uh, so we, we started, uh, we did our homework on it. We said, okay, this is, a, this is great because the, why are liquidations compelling sometimes if the underlying businesses are growing? So you're selling off assets, getting cash, distributing that out to the shareholders initially as a return of capital. So tax redistribution, very nice to get that. And yet the underlying businesses were growing. The stock kept going up in the early years after they were selling assets. Usually on a liquidation, you're taking money out of the bucket. There's less money in the bucket, but the, it was sort of a money machine of underlying businesses. And so it, it worked its way out and then it, it, it went into uh, the ether as it liquidated. But the fact is that it was an incredible rate of return for us. And so it's, um, you, you have to do your homework and dig deeper. Again, that goes back to Michael Price, read the footnotes, understanding what you own, understand what the, when it says other assets and other liabilities, what are those things? Really understand them. Sometimes other assets, especially in European companies, they could be huge portfolios of securities where they're valuing them I mean, accounting rules have changed over the years. They used to carry these things at cost. And so they just never mark them again. And you'd realize they own some stake in some other company that's up, you know, 40 X over the last 30 years. And they never, they just carry it at their original cost. So you realize that there could be lots of, there's always a chance that you have hidden uh, liabilities, but there's also a chance you have hidden assets. And, um, and so you can do that. And so we, we've seen a couple of liquidations over the years where they were just home runs. The problem is they liquidate. So then you have to, you have to find another one. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And when did you initially begin investing in these uh, special situations? And do you have any advice for students if they're looking to learn more about how to invest in special situations? I was lucky that I started at the firm that I did where 
um, Michael was focused on, we didn't call it special six in those days. It's just, that's what the firm did. And so it, but it always appealed to me because it was digging. It was things breaking up or spinning off. It was restructurings. It was quirky preferred securities. The equity investors generally never look at preferreds. In a lot of cases, there's a lot of opportunity in preferreds coming out of a crisis. I mentioned those shipping stocks before. There were so many interesting preferreds that were trading at just levels that made absolutely no sense. Nobody cared about them. And we were able to own some of those. Um, and then they all went to par plus, plus accrued and you, you just got paid extremely well. Um, I would say, so for me, I think that it's finding companies where there are, it's sort of two tracks that I focus on. One is, is maybe it's the easier track. It's, are they compounding machines? A lot of people use the phrase compounder and they overuse it. They'll talk about stocks being compounders and then inevitably during a crisis or an issue, a pandemic, you start to realize, wait a minute, that's not a compounder. That stock's uncompounded. And so you want to understand, is it truly a compounder? Do their businesses have, as we would call it, pricing power? Right. Can they defend their price and can they raise prices? They don't always have to be able to raise prices, but they want to be able to at least defend their pricing. I'm saying you don't, they don't have to always grow the prices and just have margin, margins constantly improve. But if they have cost inflation, you want to know that they can pass it through quickly, not, not a year later, where, so they'll have this huge gap and, and really have a profit issue. Um, so I just like seeing things where this, I'll say stuff is happening. So the one track is where things are happening that we think are catalysts to get value out. The other side is the compounders where they're kind of doing all the hard work for you, but in a way they are the catalyst. If you look at Exor, E-X-O-R, that's the Agnelli family holding company. Uh, and John Elkin, I, I, I label this internally as a classic compounder, but by no stretch of the imagination is he a boring classic downtrodden compounder he's constantly when i think when he was 22 or 23 his grandfather said you're going to take over one day when he was 28 he became the chairman now he brought in he had sergio marchione who he unleashed to to do his thing taking over chrysler during the financial crisis uh recently they merged with uh peugeot creating a powerhouse but along the way they're evolving away from industrial businesses and they're going into luxury brands. They bought 24% of Louboutin, which is the ladies' shoes and accessories. So shoes with the red soles. And uh, my point is they're constantly evolving. They bought a reinsurance business a few years ago. Um, they just sold it for $9 billion. Um, so they're value guys with a value mindset, but they're constantly regenerating. They're, I wouldn't call them traders, but they're long-term investors, but they're opportunistic when they can sell. So I love finding those kinds of companies where in a way he's his own, I hate to call it his own activist, but he's his own aggressive investor. He's doing all the hard work, he and his team, and we can take advantage of it. And um, by partnering, by investing with these good uh, jockeys, and they're not necessarily working every day of the week, meaning the stocks are always outperforming, but over long periods of time, you see that they really do trounce the uh, market and they really do uh, crank out compelling returns. So that's part, that's the one where they're doing all this work for you. And then the other ones are the ones where maybe they're breaking up, spinning off, peeling off their pizza slices, like I said before. So things are happening that should unlock value that's been in there uh, uh, for years. I mean, look, you could look at companies currently right now that we own, like Barry Diller's company, IAC, right? I. We look at IAC and we say, this is what we call a magic money machine. So Dill we lumped this into our family control bucket because Diller and the CEO, Joey Levin, control enough stock. The family doesn't have to be the same people in the family, it can be multiple. But the point is they control it and they, they buy, build, grow, nurture businesses and then spin them to shareholders. And over the years, it's everything from Expedia, TripAdvisor, uh, Ticketmaster, which is Live Nation today. But a couple of years ago, they spun off Match. 
at one point, match was worth over 100% of the market cap. So you were getting everything for, an, for less than free or more than free, whatever. And uh, in any case, we sold off match, nothing wrong with the company, but we wanted to own the machine, the money machine. Then they did Vimeo. They spun that off uh, last summer. That, that has not fared as well as a public company. But for me, I think of a magician with a hat. And I don't need to keep the rabbits. But I want to know I have the hat that can keep plucking more rabbits out of the hat. So IAC is something that we own today that we, we like a lot. And it's been doing this compounding over many, many years. And uh, there are other kinds of companies, even in shipping today, that are still compelling. Zim Shipping, which is an Israel-based shipping business controlled by one of the wealthiest groups in Israel, but it's listed here on the New York Stock Exchange. They only IPO'd a little over a year ago. The stock's up more than 4X from, I mean, you're in a supply chain storm where uh, shipping rates have exploded. And so they are, when they IPO'd, they, they had forecast a billion of EBITDA for 2021, in January of 21, they did. Uh, they upgraded their guidance four times. By the end of the year, they were forecasting over six billion for the year, which was more than the market cap when they came to the market. So, again, finding these cyclical or commodity type businesses as they come out of the the carnage can be fascinating areas as well. So, what would I say to students? It's everybody else is screening on numbers. You're going to get the same outcome in the same universe as everybody else. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it means in addition to that, I, I would be looking for keyword searches that are other things. It's not like the old days when I started doing it. And if I wrote spinoff, it would give me the next law and order spinoff. You know, it, it, literally that's what would come out of these searches. You can, technology is better today. You can get, you create your own proprietary keywords and so many interesting things will come along. And the key is to say no many more times than you say yes, because you want the fattest pitches of all. And more and more, I've realized I'm less interested in shorter term things. I want things that I'm comfortable giving it time to work, um, because in the long run, some of those actually can evolve into uh, compounders uh, and can continue to be sort of the gifts that keep on uh, giving. And, it's, um, and you're not going to get it right all the time. So you just and, and, and what I would also say to the students is just uh, latch on to people who have blazed the trail before you in terms of reading, absorbing, whether it's, you know, Buffett or, who, you know, I've, this will be my 21st year going to the Berkshire meeting. Am I going to learn something that's going to change my life? I don't think so. But the fact is, so the last two years we didn't go, it wasn't in person. But what we do is we, we get, we have, we go to dinners, we go to have lunches, a lot of our friends, frenemies, and competitors go. And we kind of all kind of get to hang out with each other. There's this reunion aspect. We come over from all over the country or even the world and share notes, thoughts, ideas. It's just incredible. And so I, I do think the networking aspect, it's not, hey, how many cards can I collect? It's what, what can I learn from this group? And then you just file it away. And even when we're looking at companies, so I'm doing a trip to Europe in a few weeks. Part of the trip is, is maintenance, companies we already own. Some are things we're working on that are new. And some are companies that are what we call wishful thinking ideas. They're not cheap enough. They're not compelling enough. We actually will say to the CEO, hey, can't you stumble for one quarter? Give us a shot. But I mean, we're, we're kind of kidding. But the point is you do the work now so that should that day come, you're ready. And so it's doing your homework it's, you know, you need to get your Jedi training, you know, and so it's doing your work before you need it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually Israel originally, so very happy to hear you speak about an Israeli company. Um, what are some countries outside of the U.S.? Have there been any in particular that you found very attractive for these types of, of uh, situations? Um, I would say that, uh, so Germany is going through a period now where you have uh, a lot of industrial business, mid-sized companies, family controlled. They're generationally transitioning. In a lot of cases, the, the, the children, they're not kids now, but they just maybe don't want to be owners of the business. So they, but they want the money. 
And so, uh, and the dividends and whatever. So you're seeing a lot of M&A activity in Germany in these industrial uh, mid-sized companies. Um, you're seeing Norway, we do a lot of the Nordics. Norway is going through an incredible transformation. The, the genesis of the bulk of the wealth in Norway is fossil fuels, right? They discovered oils, I guess, in the early 70s. And um, they, um, all kinds of businesses sprung up around it. Oil services, offshore rigs, drilling, whatever, um, and everything that you could think of. What's happening now in Norway, uh, as the world is going more green, especially in Europe, is a lot of the families that control businesses are taking the capital that they, that they, uh, the wealth that, that, that was generated, and they're sort of getting away from what made them wealthy, and they're going the other way. They're, they're sort of leading the charge in uh, offshore wind, carbon capture, other renewable type situations. And it's fascinating as we meet with them, we can pay the old valuation. So we're paying to buy a dinosaur, but we're getting the tomorrow opportunity at the dinosaur price. And so Norway is an incredible environment. So 20 years ago, Sweden was this hub of technology where all these guys were leaving Ericsson starting new businesses. Some made it, some didn't make it. Now Norway has become a hub of technology as well. All kinds of uh, interesting um, um, tech related to uh, uh, renewables and related, but other things as well. There, there's, uh, there's, there's just a, a wonderful growth of entrepreneurs on, that have evolved out of, as I say, older businesses. And so the, uh, I would say the biggest carbon footprint generators of yesterday are truly at the forefront of this transitional energy process. It's really remarkable. Um, and so Norway, Sweden, especially, Sweden is the, is the land of the roll up. So they have companies that are conglomerate like where the market actually does not penalize them for being conglomerates. They give them premiums. Um, and so we own a company called Lifco, L-I-F as in Frank, CEO, Lifco. A guy named Carl Bennett controls it. Carl is one of the great entrepreneurs in Sweden. He controls that. He has another company called Yetinga or Getinga, but it's pronounced Yetinga. And it's a, a healthcare business. But Livco, we participated when he IPO'd it, I don't know, five years ago. I think it's up 11X. We didn't expect it to be up 11X, but he just rolls up other businesses, dental equipment, um, robotics for demolition, just all kinds of quirky, uh, I just pulled it up here. They actually IPO'd in 2014. It's further than it back than I thought, but it's the best performing stock we've owned. And yet it just, it's a stock nobody ever asks us about, but it's this amazing compounding machine. He still owns about 50% of the company. And uh, so now he's one of the maybe top five richest guys in, in Sweden. Uh, and his other company, Yatinga got into a lot of problems a few years ago. He changed the management, restructured the whole situation. And it just, it went from, I think, 70 to 400 at some point. And just, they're just, he's just a, a, a value creator, like con consistently across all kinds of industries. So Norway, and Sweden has other roll-ups like that as well. As I say, it's, it's, it's remarkable because in most other markets, many of these types of businesses just got looked at as conglomerates and they get uh, valued at a discount to the sum of the parts, uh, I would say. The Swedes like these roll-ups. Um, and then when they compound well through acquisition, but they also have strong organic growth, it's sort of a, so just a home run. And so those, I would say France, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like to invest in France. I love France, FYI, for any French people out there. Um, look at Vivendi. Um, you know, it's now controlled by the Bolloray family. Uh, when they first took a stake back, I think also in about, I mean, that was 2013. Um, people didn't realize it. The greatest gem of all was inside Vivendi, Universal Music Group. It was buried in a, around with all these other things that were underperforming. They've spent years. So this was a net debt problem at Vivendi. The prior management didn't do a great job. It had an enormous amount of net debt. Uh, the Bolloray Group came in. They started cleaning it up, selling off assets. Some people will say they sold Activision too soon. They had a huge stake in Activision, which you can't argue they didn't, but they used that capital to do other things. 
Um, and they transformed it from net debt to net cash over a couple of years, paid out bonus dividends. So France, it's, uh, and they spun off Universal uh, towards the end uh, last summer, I think. So we now own Universal Music and we own Vivendi. We like the rump, the remain co of the business. There's a lot of opportunity there. But we like, there's, there's, it's not so much about countries as much as it is individual cases, but we do find there's more things to do in France, as I said, uh, uh, Italy is starting to bubble up. Italy has had so many opportunities over the years. Uh, and I think it's been a, a tomorrow story for many, 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 many years. Uh, but now you're seeing KKR going in, trying to take over Telecom Italia. And maybe that'll break up, maybe not. You're just seeing a lot of things happening. And you're seeing a transformation of conglomerates as they thin out, meaning conglomerates generally in Europe have been focusing on less and less verticals. So they're getting skinnier, but taller because they make acquisitions in the fewer verticals. They spin off or sell off what now become non-core assets. Some other group buys that, enhancing their verticals. So you're just seeing the pieces on the chessboard move around, uh, uh, evolve quite dramatically. And I know it's an old story, but this Vivendi case, when we first got there, it was a sleepy business. It was a value trap. All the value guys got suckered into it in the prior decade. And it was, it was a, it's one of those cases where it's like a, it's a 50 cent dollar. And as the stock goes down, you still say, well, it's a 50 cent dollar, but meanwhile, you're getting wiped out. It's always worth half of, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a sort of, it's, it's a quick way to uh, oblivion. And it needed somebody to come in and kickstart a transformation. And that's what the Bolare group did. So we actually not only own Vivendi and Universal Music, but we own Bolare, uh, their holding company is a public company. And they, they've announced they're gonna sell their ports in Africa. So they're gonna be flush with cash uh, as well. So they're selling some of their legacy businesses as that industry is evolving. So there's just a lot happening out there. So I would tell your, your friends out there or frenemies, whoever's in your class, uh, it's, it's really tracking spins and breakups and and management changes and, and really when a sleepy company brings in a new CEO who has, is highly credentialed, maybe one of the single greatest lessons going back to Michael Price was when he said, I'm gonna teach you how to read the newspaper. I'm like, he's gonna teach me how to read? But his point was most people don't, there was a section, there still is, but everything's online now. There was a, there was a section called Who's News? Who's News was management changes. And it was always looked there for sleepy businesses where better management was coming in. And that was sort of the early look because people just didn't value it. They would just say, oh, it's a sleepy company. Who cares who they got? We would try to figure out who is that? And again, you didn't have the internet. You had to do a different kind of due diligence. It was a lot more laborious. Today, we can do a lot more work uh, using uh, all kinds of resources. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, I just think those kinds of things are important. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what do you think about investing in Eastern Europe? Um, well, right now, you should have asked me this question a week ago. I might have answered it. <laughs> um, you know, look, I, I, generally speaking, I don't have an issue with Eastern Europe um, at all. I would say we have generally stayed in the more developed uh, markets because of uh, accounting issues, uh, corporate governance issues. Uh, it's different country by country. Uh, and so um, we would look there. I, I generally like it more when I have a company in Sweden or Norway or Germany, and they have a stake in something in Eastern Europe in some way, um, because I get sort of, I get their expertise as well. And so we've generally sort of, I would say just shied away just, just because of, again, corporate governance, it is evolving very rapidly, positively. So that's good. Uh, there's, there's wonderful companies in those markets. There's also ones that you'd stay away from. Um, and so you have a lot of family control or individual control businesses the way they think about shareholders in some of these companies, it's true everywhere, but it's, it's been true in some of those markets. It's just, it's, it's a different perspective. 
also it's a much those are much less liquid markets um and but we're always looking for for compelling ideas and i would say this i don't have to go to eastern europe i can stick in the more developed markets and get just as compelling of a situation where i have better governance better ability to do my due diligence um and it's you know, I will say when I went to Sweden, which is not in Eastern Europe, but when I went to Sweden at the beginning, they had no rules on insider trading. You'd see CEOs selling their own shares like the day before they'd announce bad news. Now they have very strong insider trading rules. Uh, they have windows when you can meet them and can't meet them. Some of their rules are stronger than any other country in Europe. So they went from, from nothing to a lot. So that's kind of, it's taken years, but it's kind of working its way across Europe, and I think those are good things that are happening. And so I, I think that that is an opportunity uh, going forward. But but there's so many dislocations out there that you can just take advantage of other markets, and you just get more liquidity, more ability to get information, publicly available information, uh, and do your due diligence on the people and um, and what's happening. Um, but if we work to go there, we would start with the conglomerates because the conglomerates yeah. generally give you a chance to get a cross section of, of situations. Um, and I would say that, uh, that, you know, you start that way and you'll kind of work your way down. That's how I would do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then for concluding question, uh, what is your advice for students who hope to start a fund in the future in terms of how do you uh, raise the capital? When do you know if you're ready? Those types of things. To start a fund, look, the world has changed. The world has really changed. And when I first went off on my own in the in 2000, the year of 2000, you, maybe you weren't even born yet. Maybe you were, maybe you weren't. Um, but the thing is, I, I literally would... I would meet somebody on a Tuesday and by Friday, I'd have a commitment when I was raising money. It was crazy. Now I might meet somebody on a Tuesday. I might get a commitment on a Friday, but it's two years later. And uh, so it's, it's, it, the, the, the lead time has changed. Investors that are allocators, uh, family offices across the board are much more sophisticated than they were back then in the sense that they might have their own team helping doing the process uh, due diligence and vetting where way back, they might rely on some external advisor. Uh, so they've brought a lot of it in-house. They're doing their own portfolios. Uh, it's harder to find um, people who want to be the first, the initial seed investor, frankly. Um, in back then, people were like, oh, well, the stats, and I don't even know if it was really true, but they, they would say the stats show that the startup hedge funds or whatever kind of funds in the first two or three years had their best performance before they got too big. So you had this race of people that wanted to get in early. That evolved. Now you have a, a cadre of people who say, great, call me after you have X. So if nobody wants to be the first do a domino, not, I shouldn't say nobody. Many people do not want to be the first domino. Once you have the first domino, you can knock it over and, they, and a lot of others will start to be more and more interested. It feeds on itself. Uh, I'll say there's some sort of peer affirmation uh, where, oh, those, and especially if it, your seed investor allows you to use their name um, and there's some name that's well known in some, some way, it's invaluable. So having that starting, if you're going out and trying to raise money literally from scratch, it's, I've done it more than once. Uh, and it's, it's very, very, very difficult uh, but once you get out of the gate, you can build uh, from there. But as I say, I think investors generally have just, there've been so many things that have happened over the years and there's a proliferation of managers. Uh, I'm sure you could, without even thinking about it, but now if I say it to you, you're going to think about it. How many people do you know that have started a fund in the last couple of years? It's probably a much larger number when you start jotting them all down because people will start with less capital than they would in the past. People who just want to get going, be their own independent thinker, boss, whatever. Uh, and, and even the, the prime brokers and all of those, they just had a different view back then because they had less people starting out. There's, there's so many small strategies, thin, 
people have thinly sliced certain strategies. Somebody only buys sort of certain kinds of certificates of whatever. Somebody does. So there's a lot of nuanced funds out there. It's 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 tough. They and they're all competing for capital. I've seen a lot of people lately that I've talked to. They're creating co-invest vehicles. They gave up on launching a fund and they're just doing co-invests when they have an interesting idea that go around. I promise you have to market each deal because you don't have a vehicle. And so it, it's it, it has evolved, but you can't you see startups every year coming out. Um, and you have to start with more infrastructure than you used to have. You could back then start with less infrastructure. Now today you can outsource a lot of it. You can have compliance and ops and everything and latch onto a bigger bank's uh, systems. You still need somebody in-house to help oversee that. You can't just rely that it's going to be right all the time. But the fact is that there's, there's so where it's maybe tougher to raise money, there's so many more resources to build your business. Um, and especially if you have something that's a little differentiated, we're in, we're, this is the other kind of me too. I mean, there's, there's, there's me twos, me threes, me tens, me twenties out there where people are vying to be the same as. And guess what? They're being trounced by ETFs. They're being trounced by other cheap costing uh, or low priced uh, alternatives that you can buy to get a certain tactical perspective or whatever those investors are looking for. There's a thousand slices and dices out there. And so if you're bringing something differentiated, that's great. If not, um, it's, it's, and, and sometimes the best way for maybe some of your pals to move forward is actually join a larger firm, see what it's like, see how it works, learn everything you can, knowing that in three years, you're going to think of perhaps leaving unless they make it so compelling for you, but you're just learning capital raise, dealing with investors, how they deal with risk management, things that everybody thinks they know before they start. And you realize there's more to a lot of those components. Uh, so, and I'm giving you way more than you asked me for. I'm sorry. I, you know, um, that was, yeah. that was, ter that was terrific. That was a really great comment. I'm going to send you a bill for tuition. Uh, <laughs> um, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time if you're a uh, busy schedule to speak with us today. Happy to do it anytime. Great. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Goodbye.